Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we are asking and potentially answering 100% airtight okay. answers to the question, can we be friends with robots? Will it happen? And the reason we ask this is because we were recently approached by a robot we were propositioned uh, who, for friendship. Yeah, propositioned just for friendship. By an android. And uh, so we are. We decided we would just explore that in the context of a near biscuit. Because there's, there's this general assumption that with the development of AI that it's going to happen. But then you start digging into the specifics of it and I just don't know, I don't, I don't really know. So. That's it's a legitimate question on my mind. I don't have a specific answer. You know me. I just want to verbally process it out, but come to an airtight conclusion. Well, I I mean, having not thought about it very much. Okay. I have an answer. You have an answer. But I'm not, I'm going to hold it until the end and see if it still holds. All right. And then my objective would be to change your answer. <clears throat> but you don't so know that by you the don't end, know what my answer is. I know. And then by you should write it down because my objective is to change your answer no matter what it is. It's like extreme devil's advocate. Um, I'm, I'm too, just, just so you know, a little pe peeling it back, pulling back the curtain a little bit. Open the kimono. Uh, the previous podcast we recorded two days ago, and this is two days later. This is 48 hours further into this cold, my cold cycle, and I've actually been going into, I've been going on the internet and. Oh gosh, of course you have. No. You know, the thing is. Well, what are you convinced you have? What type of cancer? No, the thing that I was interested in is I was like, does the progression of a cold, meaning the symptoms. Lead to death. The symptoms, no, I'm not worried about my, 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 my life at this point. I know this is just a regular cold, but does, okay. do the symptoms of a cold, is the progression the same for everyone? Because I would have always said, no, my colds always start with a so-and-so. My colds always start with a so-and-so. My colds always start with a so-and-so. <laughs> You know, that's like the Muppets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are I just you, did where, all the Muppet voices. Were you on SesameStreet.com asking about colds? <laughs> and uh, and then how long, so I just, I wanna ask you, cause I'm just, you're just a layman, right? You haven't been on the internet looking at these, this specific information. <laughs> I'll take it. So what do you think the typical progression right. of a cold is? And then what do you think the, the average length of a cold is? And like what happens in those certain days? Just like throw out some facts. And if I am, uh, considered to be a layman, I'll take that as a compliment if that means that I rely on my own experience and intellect and intuition versus leaning way too heavily on Science? what's beyond my keyboard. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I go on feels, man. I'm going completely on feels here. Uh, I think that's part of our codependence, right? Is that like I just assume you're gonna at least take the stance that you know it, so well, I'm not gonna waste my time. The reason but I, I will looked, answer your but question. But the reason I looked it up was because I, I 48 hours from right now, we will be on stage rehearsing, doing a sound check, getting ready to then perform a concert. And so I was looking, I was like, I wanna kinda know where I'm gonna be. I wanna be able to mentally prepare. And that led into this whole like, well, this is the life cycle of a cold and this is what the symptoms are and this is when the day, this is typical, this is all typical. Okay. So what do you think that is? Um, What's the first question? The life cycle, how long does it last? Just in any part of it you I would say a, a typical cold virus runs its course in five days. You think it's more than that? And you know what? I believe that the perception of an individual is that it's that it's uh, about five days, seven to ten days. Okay, but that, that includes like a ramp up and a ramp down where you think you're That's better the full you don't cycle, know you have it. The full cycle. Okay, and what's the other question? What's the first symptom? What's the second symptom? What's and is the, it the same for everyone? Right. No, uh, no, I believe that. I mean, it, what is it with you when an, it happens? Uh, well, enough has gone through our family that you know, certain family members they'll complain about headaches and like a a, a really bad sore throat, and then I'll get it, and I might have the headache, but I don't have the sore throat. But I'll have I, I'll have a different, slightly different symptoms, but I have to assume that it just went around the house. So, yeah, well, they're, so I, yeah I, they're never a completely, even for me, never completely the same, but I would say on average, there's an initial symptom and then there's, yeah. 
I have an initial symptom. But what most is most often? What did your what did Sesame Street say? It said that well, it listed a a a, a collection of symptoms that a, a lot of times are the onset, but the sore throat is always in that initial set of symptoms. Like you don't end your cold with a sore throat, right? You usually start your cold with a sore throat. For me, sometimes like, I'll never have a sore throat, but I guess that's just a really mild cold. But yeah. So so your answer is that there is a like a a viral protocol of symptoms that everyone goes through. It well, just, that in general, yeah. And so for me, so the same cold does not manifest itself differently in different people. Uh, well, according to your no, I I'm not gonna I. I, I mean, I'm, it just said this is all typical, so I'm not making blanket statements about it wouldn't affect a person differently. I'm just saying that I would have said before I looked at this article that I typically start with a sore throat and then I start doing all the stuff that you're supposed to, you know, taking Zycam and zinc, zinc, whatever I've got. If I've got coldies or Zycam, like some sort of zinc thing, you start yeah. to get hydrated, vitamin C. Googling obsessively. And then I'd say seven out of 10 times the sore throat recedes and nothing happens. It does not become a full blown cold, right? Whether that's the stuff that I did to prevent it or whether it's just it, my body f fought it off, I don't know. Okay. If, if the sore throat gets really intense and this is what happened with this one, then I'm like, I don't think I'm coming back from this one. Like if it go, becomes to go really difficult to swallow and you're you like, oh no. You have to go oh, through no. the tunnel. You can't turn back and then the next and exit through the entrance. Then the next symptom is it moves to the nose. And that's when the, stu the stuffiness, the runniness. So, and then it said the peak when 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 the virus is is as spread as it can be throughout your body. It's the peak activity of the virus. You are your most contagious. Is when your face. It said your face may feel like a faucet, which is exactly oh, the gosh. way I described it. So when I was shoulder to shoulder with you all day, yet uh, I was day before at yesterday. peak contagion. Oh, dang it! And then you laid out. Yesterday, you should have laid out day before yesterday. We had too much to do. You laid out too late. We could have shifted the stuff from two days ago. I don't know how that works. You know, we have shifters and schedulers and yeah. So I just I basically just rested all day yesterday. Jacob's shaking his head like that's how you think of me, a shifter <laughs> and a scheduler. <laughs> yeah, when you're not around, I just I call you shifter. Oh, Let's get that bearded shifter to to oh, to gosh. schedule it up. Know that this is not coming from me. Well, you know I'm joking. I don't call you that. Um, I call you Jacob, even when you're not around. <laughs> That's all I've ever called you. And then no nicknames. And then, okay. Oh, first of all, shifter. I never, never. <laughs> initial symptoms. Now I feel like my nose is running. No, one to three days. One to three days. Peak cold symptoms days four to seven. Oh gosh. And then tail end of the cold is days eight to 10. Again, this is all typical. You've sabotaged our show, man. So by the time you're listening to this, we're back from the show. Uh, um, I don't think you're gonna get sick, man, because that's not an initial symptom. Oh. That's just psychosomatic. Do you have a sore throat? No, good. Yeah, you're well, fine. Yeah, it, maybe it, I had a tinge right then. <laughs> uh, but then. You're, you're literally rubbing off on me. I'm not only emotionally like, Getting wigged Hold on, out. But this is not but like I'm fit. You're physically rubbing Hold off. Hold on, but me. this is not hypochondriac hy hypochondriacism, if that's a word. Yeah, that, that's for not, me. It now that's, is that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm just saying this is what I learned in my research. But the the last Did you stay in bed all the, day. Yeah, I, just, it, re which just is, researching, which is really really hard to do. By the way, like it's hard I, to make I, yourself go back to sleep. I haven't done that since the vasectomy. Oh, well, uh, no, I I've been sick a few times, but I didn't. I ended up it was over the weekend. I ended up doing some work from the bed. Christy gets mad because she's like, "Why do you always get sick on the weekend?" And you're like, oh, "I got to stay in bed all day." It's like, well, I understand that's frustrating, but that's just how it's happened. I think my body knows that it can relax, and it, the white blood cells just take the weekend off or something. Yeah, there, 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 I, there's a lot of that. It, I mean, I know there's there's a lot of mental. I haven't gotten sick at all this entire year, and it was just like. My body was just like, all right, you need to get it. You need to do it. You need to get it done. You need to get it in and get it over with. <laughs> um, kind of like thing a I'll dentist appointment or is something. Is that the the tail end of the cold is when, like, I'm I'm probably day seven right now, so it's like receding. Like the, my my nose is still stuffed up, but it's not running. 
And then a lot of times it will transition into a cough, which is a little worrying if I've got a cough while we're trying to sing, but I think I'll be okay. But then do you know that you can, and this is totally normal. You know you have a lingering cough after a cold a lot of times? Mm-hmm. They say that it is not uh, unusual for the cough to last 18 days after the cold. And that is not a concern. It doesn't mean you necessarily, it doesn't mean you have an infection. It doesn't mean it's gone anywhere else. It's just it, you can have you an con- 18 day cold. Are you contagious? You're not contagious either? Uh. I mean, that's my main concern. I'm you, talking about me. I don't think you're- For con- me. No, you're not contagious. No, are you contagious? Right now? Yeah, to me. Uh, Not nearly as much as I was two days ago. Gosh. You got through the worst of it. Um, So we packed our stuff, we're going on this trip. By the time you listen to this, we'll be back from it. But hey, um, I and I was gonna say follow us on Instagram because we're going. I intend on posting some stories. Shout out to Link Lamont on Instagram. Yep. But those stories will have dissipated. Maybe not. But if you archive them, if you if you make them a highlight, you know you know how to do I that. I haven't done that yet. I I haven't done one, so now I'm like, I'm nervous to like make one. Oh, you just got to do it. Just got to do it. All right, I'll do that. Make a highlight. So if you're listening to this and this even dissipated, you can still go back and see the. Um, Britain's very excited. He's coming in later. He's going. He's going with us. He's see if I can get him sick. Well, don't. I think okay. we're, we're he and I are sharing hotel rooms. Oh, good. Just for efficiency's sake. That's good. I hadn't thought about that. I don't think we had to do that, honestly. I don't. But you know how I think. I'm just like, uh, let's bring Britain along. He can stay in my room. It's like <laughs> I, we could have given the guy his own room, and we could have get. I could have kept have yeah, my own room. Yeah, that's the thing. By you know, giving him that his point? by giving him his own room, you therefore get your own room. I don't. I don't. Did you not think about that? All I thought about was just the efficiency of it. I think it'll be fun. We'll have a slumber the party The best night. part of traveling is having my own hotel room. I mean, that's the only reason I tour. What's the best part of waking up? Folgers, of course. In your cup. <laughs> but I mean. Folgers in your cup. <laughs> Folgers we, in every hotel room. Yeah, Folgers is uh, not a sponsor because their coffee is horrible. Oh, well, I wouldn't well, even call it horrible. Well, hold on, but what if they wanted to be a sponsor? No, because it's horrible. I, I could never be sponsored by Folgers. I, I bet you I can make you like Folgers, man. I bet you I could sneak Folgers into some. All right, th- G- that's a GMM. I think it was a GMM. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. I think we've well, done we a co- forgotten. We, let's do I it think again. we did a coffee taste test, and I wonder what we said about Folgers. So you roll in this morning. I texted you. What did I text you this morning? You texted me this morning? I texted you this morning. What? Don't you remember? It was only this morning. I thought you texted me last night. No, was it last night? It was last night at 8.38. Oh yeah, last night. What did I say last, what did I text you last night? You said, how are you feeling? I think I am checking a luggage. (laughs) (laughs) Checking a luggage. Well, I asked how you were feeling first, but my main objective, as you can tell, was now that I'm concerned that I'm checking a bag, I wanna make sure you are, but I need to ask how you're feeling first. You know. Why do you gotta worry about me checking a bag? Cause you don't wanna be the only guy checking a bag? I just, I, I felt, I don't want you, sh- I didn't want you to be shaming me for, ch- I didn't wanna slow down the whole transportation process and I, then, I, cause I know how it would be, it's like, man, I, I didn't, I'm not checking a bag. No, and then the whole on. time we're checking my bag, you're like, I don't, I'm not d- checking a bag. But hold on, I don't do that. I'm not saying you do it, no, I no, just don't want you to do it. That's not in my personality profile. I don't pick on other people's decisions. I don't do that. That's not my thing. But man. you get so nervous when we're checking into a hotel. You're telling me that that wouldn't push you over the edge. I'm not saying you constantly. Oh, no. you mean checking into? I just felt like I put a tar- you mean a target. You target on my the, back. The airline. You mean getting on the plane? Checking in. You said yeah. checking into the hotel. I was like, I don't. I don't. Not have, the hotel. I don't the have a lot of. <laughs> there's no stress when we're checking into the hotel. The airport. Yeah, I mean, but. I don't get I don't get stressed out when we travel because and then what did you say we make I get stressed out when I travel with my family I don't get stressed out when I travel with us because we always that is scheduled okay, correctly yeah yeah but we leave on time okay it's all scheduled ahead of time I'm glad we're having this conversation because when I'm checking my luggage and apparently you're not well, I mean what did you say your response was I'm I'm feeling better I think I'll be even better tomorrow I was like great. But then, as far as the luggage goes, I don't think you responded because I didn't have an opinion. Because I don't. Because I don't. I. I. Because again, I, you, yeah, it was great. Okay. You want me to comp- compliment you on it? No, I. Just you wanted felt- to hear if I was going to check a luggage yeah. as well. Well, first of all, I didn't know at the time, but I didn't have plans to. But I also was like, he can check luggage. I don't care. 
check our luggage. I, the, the one thing I almost did was make fun of the way you said it, <laughs> which is I will do that. In I, don't a heartbeat. I, I don't know why. I'll make checking. fun of the way somebody says something in a heartbeat. I was gonna. I wrote. I was gonna write check a bag, and when I wrote the uh, then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna use the word luggage, <laughs> but I didn't delete the word a. I didn't delete the uh, so it came out check a luggage, but it was supposed to be check a the bag or check luggage. The only reason I'm not luggage. checking a luggage is because my backpack is uh, that, what is it, the tortoise brand? I don't know what it is. It's very big. It's it's a suitcase it's in and of itself. It's too big actually. I, I don't know, do you like that? It's I too big. It. It's too big to carry something like that around. No, because now I don't have to check a luggage. And you know what the other thing I realized um, was there is some, there was a type of product that has gone the way of the dodo, and that is a. Those suitcases that you had to this, pull on a string? The suit, yeah, that, the suitcases that have a laptop slot. They, they don't, those, those are, they're going out. Nobody wants those because everybody bought them, including us, and then what do you do? You end up packing your stuff on a carry on, but you keep your laptop in the bag that it's always in and then you use that as like your your backpack, your additional bag. You don't leave your 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 computer bag at home, take the computer out and put it in your carry-on because what about all the other crap that you need every single day that's in your laptop bag? Well, I do exactly what you just said you don't do. What but I, I put it into a backpack that has its, I put it into you, a backpack. A bigger backpack. That has a bunch of stuff. We travel a lot. I, That's that a, backpack is already. The, the only, I think you're doing it. <clears throat> I think your 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 approach is subpar. You know, you you bring and I know this is regular, ironic that I'm the one judging you now. But you bring a regular backpack on a trip, and I'll do that if it's a short trip. But if I need some stuff to be packed and I don't want to check anything, I put it in that. Why don't you? Big why don't bag. you want to check anything? I'm checking something. Is that in, see? I'm interpreting that as judgment. I'm saying you, think, you must think it's better to not check something. Well, first of all, I prefer to travel with my big backpack because it has other things. I th there's a bunch of pockets in there that have like hand sanitizer and moisturizer and sunscreen and all kinds of things that are just in there always that I don't have in my regular backpack. Mm. And so I know that all I got to do is put my laptop in there. In fact, for a while there, I had a completely duplicate set of chargers for all my stuff oh, that wow. I never had to take out of that backpack. Of course, I've got children, and so they've taken them. Yeah, they're so, they're gone. But so now I just take it out of my, I just take the little coil of like, you know, laptop charger, phone charger, watch charger, and I just move it over and then I move the, and it's, it's that simple, man. See, see I, I'm taking books, I got a big book. Okay. My, my, my wife bought me a novel by a guy named James A. McLaughlin, and she just bought it because his name was McLaughlin. Bearskin, I'm gonna read that. Okay. It's, I don't, it just, it's got a cool, it's huge, it's a hardback. Where am I gonna put that? I gotta have a big bag for that. See, I think if I had a big bag, it, what you're saying is really appealing to me, like having everything on my back. You also should have your but own here's what toiletries I would do. ready to go. They I don't would, duplicate your own toiletries. I would constantly, I, I would come back from a trip and I would I would carry that around forever because my laptop bag basically has all that stuff in it. Hand balm, hand sanitizer, multiple headphones, chargers, all that stuff is there anyway. For my, for, I, every day I travel. Every time I move I'm traveling. Technically true. So that's, that's what I do. But then I also like pack a freaking big piece of luggage that I gotta check that has everything, including a pillow. G given the upcoming episode of GMM that we're that we're hold on, you're packing a pillow for use not on the plane but in the hotel room. Yes, man, you shouldn't have listened to that hard of that info, man. That it's not that big. Of it thing. also gives me a much higher quality sleep because my sleep is so dependent on my pillow. No, that's a personal problem. <laughs> no, it's just know thyself, man. I, I I've, I'm winning on two fronts: hygiene and posture like neck posture, good night's sleep, you know, it's the start of everything. So anyway, I, I check, I like I'm, to I'm adapt, checking some luggage. I just like to adapt to different pillow configurations just in case I have to be, you know, during the, the apocalypse, I'm gonna be sleeping on dirt and just twigs and, 
You know, I'm gonna have like a bag full of human bones. At the end of your life, on. at the end of your life, I think as you're dying, and I'm leaning over your like wilting body, I think, I don't know what's the last thing you're gonna say is, but I think the last thing I'm gonna say to you is, I'm just gonna lean in real close and I'm gonna say, the apocalypse never happened. Yeah, but I was ready in You worked so hard. You know, it's it it it's a transactional decision for me. It's like it's very wise, and I know it. It will make me feel good to, to be prepped like you are, but I just I also feel like I just feel like. Well, here's the thing. It's not about being prepped. It's it's, it's a lot of wasted Here, my, life. My honest opinion on the pillow situation is, and and that episode comes out tomorrow in reference to when this comes out. You may by the way, so like the 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 housekeeping and what they clean or don't clean in your hotel, it's impacted my personal life. I'm bringing my freaking pillow. You may have a better sleeping experience on the bus too, com- man. Compared to what you would have had. Do you remember the pillow on the bus? The tour bus? Me neither. I don't even know if there was one. But here's what I'm saying. In the long run if you make yourself dependent on the pillow, there's gonna be more scenarios in which you just can't bring your pillow. There's gonna be times where you, the next time we travel, you'll be like, I'm not, I'm not checking a Listen, luggage. Listen, I'm already dependent on my pillow. So whenever I can have it, I'm gonna have it. And okay. then when I don't, it will be less amount of suffering than if I never brought it. And it's because I'm not gonna train myself to not need the pillow. Well, you should Forget be like about it. Jim Acock and just sleep with no pillow. Do you know that's what he did? He's 102 years old and he golfs every day. Yeah. Sleeps with no pillow. And he, he will tell you that's one of the keys to life, <laughs> sleeping with no pillow. Here's the thing with like people who are like really old. They all think they have a key to life and it's genes, man. It's nothing, it's like my key to life is I eat bacon and ice cream every day and I'm 102. Like, what? No, that's just you thumbing your nose at us, us at the rest of the gene pool. You know, don't take credit for that. And don't give the credit to bacon and ice cream. But sleeping without a pillow, that's pretty badass. Pillow. Let's talk about pillow. Let's talk about robots. Uh, but first, we wanna let you know that you can purchase Link's hat. He gave me a quick body scan to see if I had on any other <laughs> merch. No, that, just the hat. That is the thing that we're promoting, right? The camo, Yeah. the camo GMM hat. It is. It's nice, man. It's got, it's got the GMM logo and camo. Does it say mythical on the inside? No, it doesn't. It, sh- it doesn't need to. I think that might be the prototype. I think the one that you buy him does. Oh gosh. I'm, I'm not making any promises, but. You know what the best ads are? The ones where you talk about what's wrong with the product. <laughs> How the product is lacking. Who cares what it says on the inside? <laughs> it's camo. Uh, rep you boys. Go to mythical.store. Um, I like wearing hats when I travel. So I got this one, I got the, I got the black um, post-apocalypse dog hat, which is one of my favorites. I highly recommend that. As well as the bandana for when I work out from the road. That's right. I'm gonna work yeah, out from the road. Let's save that for, let's save, that could be a whole intro to an ear biscuit in and of itself. We should <laughs> okay. talk about that. Yeah, hopefully, the, hopefully it, it comes to fruition. Mythical.store, thank you for being your <laughs> mythical best, which, I, I'm not gonna equate that to spending money on us, um, so I'll take that back. Just thank you for thank you for for buying merch. I think everybody wins. I'm proud of the merch. Okay, let's talk about uh, uh, friendship. So, robots. Um, Feldman brought to our attention a Medium article by Evan Selinger called "Can We Be Friends with Robots?" And um, you know, I think he pitched it because friendship friendship's a thing for us. You know, we're friends. Right. Uh, It's been happening for a long time. Uh, Are we experts in friendship? I don't know, I, you know, on one hand I feel like we're experts at our friendship, on the other hand I feel like there's there's still so much to explore that I actually don't know if we're experts at our own friendship. I would definitely say I'm not an expert at friendship. At our friendship, like just understanding it. Um, So, you know, let's, I'm interested in filtering our feelings about our capacity to have uh, true friendship with a robot. Maybe through 
our experience in our, in our own friendship. I think there are some parallels. So okay. spoiler alert. A, a little background though. Um, in, in his article, and in a few others that I read, they mention uh, the way that Aristotle talked about friendship. And he actually, you know who Aristotle is? I've heard of him. He's a philosopher. Um, he talked about three different types of friendships. Utility friendships, which are basically, um, some examples are like business partnerships, alliances, like like a survivor alliance. Right. Speak the parlance of reality television. Um, a friendship where you, you know, you get something out of it that otherwise you wouldn't get. I call those transactional friendships, and I okay. think yeah, you can improve on Aristotle. I, I think that ninety percent or more of relationships in Los Angeles are transactional. Yeah, what can you, what can you give me life access to? Yeah, how can I? Um, the second Aristotle friendship is friendships of pleasure. Hmm. Ooh, activity buddies. You know, hey, let's let's do a sport. Let's do a hobby. Let's build. Let's build a popsicle stick castle. We did that once with the RAs. Yeah, yeah. The Royal Ambassadors. Yeah, they had this whole room, and you just go in there, and you just keep adding to the popsicle stick fort. And then we would go Pretty in there cool. after that, and at least I would go in and rip it apart a little bit. Really? Yeah. Do you notice how every once in a while you'd go in there, and it would be like well, another part had fallen? Yeah, it was like they're letting the preschoolers in here. Why are they letting the younger kids in here when nobody? They keep an eye on the younger kids. It was me. They keep coming in. Uh, so that was yeah, slowly destroying our creation. That's when it's like, hey, we just have fun together. It's all about doing. I, I think, you know, I, I think in general, guys, in my limited observation, are more more willingly settle in or settle for this type of friendship. That's just like, hey, we, you know, we just we can shoot the breeze. We can grab a brewski, or we can hike a mountain, or uh, we can play tag football. Or uh, again, popsicle sticks, and and that's good enough. Yeah. But Aristotle talks about uh, a third type of friendship called friendship of the good, which is um, perhaps a more complete friendship. I think it could be described as it's based on mutual goodwill and unselfish desire to help the other person become his or her best possible self. Hmm. So it's there's a selfless component and like a legitimate care for somebody. There's some buddy love. Mm. Um, now. Well, and I'll get in. I, I, so and, I, I think we can filter the robot conversation as we delve into it through. Yeah, well, through I mean, first of all, I, I think that it's easy, it's easy to see that robots fall, without a doubt, fall into category one. You know, right. friendships of utility. Because when we think about robots, we think about uh, what was the one from the Jetsons? Um, the maid, Rosie? Rosie. You know, right? Rosie's the maid. She's doing something, and that, and of course, you may have a relationship, but the relationship is in the context of what Rosie can do for you. So, without a doubt, that those types of friendships exist. But it's interesting can that exist. I, I think they demonstrated very well because I just bought it hook, line, and sinker that she was a member of the family. But she's a member of the family created specifically to to just clean up after him. And like you know, I never saw Astro's poop. Anywhere, you know. Now that I think about can't it, can't show poop on cartoon television. That's bull crap, man. Well, it's Astro crap. Can't show it. It's a well, rule. I actually think they could show it, but Rosie was so good at her job that it never she there was never it was never there for more than a split second. Like she had an innate ability. Her artificial intelligence was honed. But I, I considered her a member of the family. I mean, Elroy certainly loved her. Well, of course. I mean, so I, I do think it is a form of friendship because, as you talked about the transactional nature, it tends to cheapen it so much that I actually question: Can you even call that friendship? Like, I mean, it, it, are you friends with Alexa? Not Alexa. No. Or the or the Google Siri person. The Google Siri person? That's confusing. It's two different people, right? Right. Google doesn't have a name. I just call it Google. Right. Which I've which I prefer. 
because it 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 it's, it sets a strong boundary. It's not like I'm pretending that this I don't have to call it a human name. And that's an interesting thing because one of the articles I was reading was the difference between um, if you contrast sort of Western approaches to sort of embodied AI to like the way they see it in Japan, for instance. Like you just mm -hmm. sort of, I don't know exactly where that's coming from when you're like, I feel like there needs to be a, ba a boundary. Mm -hmm. But that boundary does not exist in Japan. Like the way they have embraced um, robots and the personality of robots. In fact, the uh, Sony's, I, I think it's Ibo is the name of the, is that the dog robot? Um, when one of those robots in Japan, th th those robots are so revered in Japan that when the, you can no longer r repair them, they have like a funeral for the dog. Really? Yeah. 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 Ibo. I, yeah, that's, A I B O. Yeah. And um, that's something that we're like, what? Like typically, I think the way that we would, and I don't know which one, we, I mean, we had that robot dog on the show at one point, and I don't know if that's the same one. I can't imagine that dog, because the way that would go at my yeah, that, house, because I, I think we actually had that. Was, that. You can't converse with that dog that we had on the show. Well, you can't converse with a dog, they, they speak dog anyway. So I think this dog just does yes, dog you can. things. You can, say, you can say sit to a dog. Right, well you can, I think you can say, regardless of the, whether this is the one that I've seen before, the way it would go at the McLaughlin household is we would have that thing and everybody would think it was cool for like 48 hours and then there would be like two months of like every other day somebody would do something with it and then it would be put in a closet and then it would be forgotten about and then it would be thrown away or Craigslisted or yard sailed. But if Siri sold. or Alexa could be moved into a mobile body, let's not say it looks like a, a human, but let's just say it's more Android. You know, it's a, it, it, it's a little more personified. So we're not venturing into the uncanny valley with some weirdness, but it's just like, like a rosy situation. Yeah. Um, the, I think psychologically, you would start to form bonds. I mean, of even, course you would. even when Lando goes to sleep, he's like, Okay, Google, tell me a bedtime story. And she, it, whatever, will tell a bedtime story sometimes. Well, every time he asks, every single time he asks, without fail, actually. A different one? And that, yeah, a different one. For how, how long do the stories go? Uh, maybe eight minutes. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I mean, he doesn't do, and he doesn't do it every night, but if, 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 okay, Google walked up, like strutted over, you know, did a little, did a little hammer dance over to the bad side and then told the story, all of a sudden, like he's forming a bond with with this person. And that, and moves, you, that you, moves to the second one, which is like. Are you suspicious of the bond? I, I, that, but you seem to be, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm picking up on some suspicion of whether or not this I, bond would be a good thing or not. I felt weird, it feels weirder to me to say Alexa than it does to say, okay, Google. But why? Uh, because it's, I know I'm not talking to a person and it's, it's I'm talking to a speaker. So it seems kinda stupid. It's like if I have friends over, like I feel like a douche if I'm like, okay Google, turn on all the lights. But I feel like more of a douche if I'm like, Alexa, turn on the lights. It's like, it's, I, yeah, it's I even worse <laughs> because it's like, I don't see that I, I'm talking to a speaker but I called it a human name. You're not talking to a speaker. The speaker is just the physical form. You're talking to the AI. I would feel less, I think I would feel more comfortable if it was a moving, emotive robot. Oh, so you would be more comfortable yes. if it was more human-like. Yeah, because it's, it's not physically there. It's like, who am, I, who am I fooling? But I also know that you can quickly get to that point, like, um, but but back to the Aristotle of it all. I mean, I think that the second y you said that, you know, utility friendships they de robots definitely fall into that category now. But and also, I'm not saying they. I'm just saying they 
I'm not putting them in a category. I'm saying we already know they can attain that level right. of friendship. They can also I'm attain. I'm not speaking to the next two. The next one, friendship's a pleasure. I think, you know. Yeah, a, ple um, a pleasure robot. Well, there's sex bots, of course. Yeah. Let's just get that out of the way. That's not what we're discussing. Oh, we're not? But. That's what I was looking forward to. But, <laughs> I mean, I think that that checks that box, the second box. I don't mean to keep saying the word box. Yep. But, um to bring it back into like just the normal household realm. I mean, Lando also plays Mad Libs. So he's getting bedtime stories. Uh, he plays Mad Libs with Google, you know. There's different games you can play. So there's like, you know, there's pleasure. So there's there's hobbies. Yeah, without a doubt. Activity buddies. So there you go, you've got that second one where it's just like, oh, we're hanging out and I'm, I'm, I'm playing with, I'm playing with this speaker in the same way that I would play with another well, person. I think that the human tendency is to personify um, things that don't even have any human characteristics. I mean, oh, yeah. the, the classic example of being Wilson. You know what I'm saying? A volleyball becomes a companion. There's no T in it, but I'm with you. Wilson. Wilson. Wilson is not, just like if you say Clemson, that's right. not an incorrect pronunciation. Okay. If you go to the Wilson headquarters, I guarantee you somebody there, maybe the president says Wilson. He doesn't say Wilson because Wilson makes you sound like a douche. Let's look into that um, later. The uh, but Oh, no, and trees. And trees. Trees, that's another example. You ever looked at a tree and you're like, look at the bark on that tree, it looks like there's two eyes and a smiling <laughs> that, face. That's not, what, that's, that's not what I'm talking it's about. It's like there, that tree no, no. is more, that tree no, no, but what I'm talking can about, talk to me. I'm talking about in the case of the volleyball, because humans need relationship, they yeah, are, they yeah. will create relationship from things that don't offer anything because they need some kind of interaction. So yes. your natural tendency is to develop a bond mm -hmm. with with whatever there is available to develop a bond with. In fact, so there was a, another article I was reading <clears throat> which was you know, there was the, the there was this robot uh that they had, there was like a hundred people that they sat down with this robot and they thought that they were doing some kind of experiment based on the questions that the robot was asking. Mm -hmm. But the real experiment was <clears throat> at the end of the question and answer period, the robot, they say at the end of the thing, they're saying, and now cut the robot off, now turn the robot off. And at the end of the last question, instead of, and the robot starts saying, no, don't turn me off, please, no, I'm scared of the dark, don't turn the lights off and don't turn me off. The robot begins to beg to not be turned off. Oh, wow. And people didn't of course, people this stopped. impacted people. Some people, like a quarter of the people, refused. Okay, still the to minority, turn, but. To turn off the robot at all. And then the, the, the vast majority took twice as long to turn the robot off from the people who didn't, the robot didn't beg. So, oh gosh. Did the, what, what, what do you think he would have done? I probably would have turned him off laughing. Yeah. But just yeah, because that's the kind of person I am. But that doesn't mean okay. I wouldn't have felt a little bit bad. Because. Right. I think I would have laughed too, and I would have, I would have thought it was like a prank video. Well, because there's the things that, you know, the way that you are processing information from anything that, that, that any sort of being or any, any object, it doesn't really, the nature of, as long as that thing like checks a few boxes like you were saying, it's going to just, it's gonna affect us and it's gonna connect with us in the way that a human does. For instance, without a doubt, if you're able to get all the way to the point where you can essentially make a robot indistinguishable from a human. Well, at that point, the nature of the relationship will be indistinguishable from the relationship that you could have with a human. Even if that person, depending on where you're at in terms of your worldview and what you think about spirituality and soul or whatever, even if this particular thing doesn't have a quote unquote soul, if that's what if that's your worldview, mm -hmm. your, your, the nature of your relationship with it would be indistinguishable from a relationship with a regular person. So so we we are moving to that third stage of friendship the good, complete. Like, I mean, w when you have uh, an unselfish exchange of care in a relationship, so it's like there's, 
there's empathy, there's emotion, there's a there's a responsiveness that um there AI is being developed to do that. Do we actually feel like it could go all the way? And I I think that you know, you you make a good point that like we just as it's so, it's just as much about humans as it is about uh the capability of technology and what humans can do on that front, but it's also how humans want to interact and personify things. Like I I think about my relationship with Jade, yeah. my, my dog. Who's a robot. <laughs> and you know, it, the, there's a certain capacity, I mean, she, like can she experience empathy? Can she express empathy? Can she, um, there's just a level of not, em, emotional interaction not that the, she to cannot to the degree do. that you attribute to her, without exactly, a doubt. Exactly, not, exactly. Not, uh, not, not even close. And if I think about it, I know that, but then in the experience of like, sometimes I'll just lay on the couch and she'll just like perch on my chest and I'll just like rub her behind the ears and it makes me feel great that somebody is accepting my love in this way and I believe reciprocating unconditional love. Well just this morning, we were having a difficult time with Shepard uh, getting him to school and um, Barbara comes and jumps on me like she's gone outside to do her business and then she comes and like jumps on me, that's what she does. She's like super excited, I've peed, congratulate me. Yeah. And she comes and kind of jumps up on me and like puts her head right onto my face like she does. And I was like, I said something to the effect of like, Barbara, you're so good. <laughs> yeah. You you do exactly what we want you to do, as opposed to my son. But that, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And she was do she's and but she's she's just, only got a few things that she can do. But she's but she's only she's doing exactly what you want to do, or you're able to interpret it as exactly what you need, like. Total compliance, to unconditional love, like what, unfettered devotion, you know. And the question is, do you think I? That makes me start to think that I could have that with a robot. And again, there are there are people doing this. There's a there's a chat bot called a Replica, R E P L I K A, so spelled with a K. Uh, it's an app that lets users create a digital avatar with the name or gender of their choosing and the more they talk to it, the more it learns about them. Uh, this is from Forbes. Is this, wh where can you get this app? Is it like available in the app store? Yes, yes. So like, I, I looked it up here. Let's see, uh, I've got the website pulled up so you can take a look at it while I'm, while I'm reading about this. The inventor of this thing, uh, Let's see what her name is. She had a friend die and she was developing other AI that was just more functional, like a utility friendship type thing. Mm -hmm. But then um, she had all these text exchanges um, with her with her friend who had passed away. This is like that John, that John Hamm movie that we saw at Sundance. What was the name of I that? I can't remember what it's called. It's called like, it was a woman's name, like Eudora or something. I can't remember the name it of it. It was exactly this, this scenario that you're talking about. Um, the developer used her friend's. What's the name of that John Hamm AI movie? Just type, just search that, Jacob. She used John Luca's Hamm expertise AI. in chatbot technology and computational linguistics and a large collection of his texts to create an avatar that mimicked um, the friend that had passed away. That's exactly how a, it works. A yes. kind of memorial bot. Now you've you've spoiled the movie, by the way, by saying that. But yeah, that is what it tackles because that's a that's a big reveal. But um, it is. Yeah. So the developer, Qda, says with chatbots we had missed the point. We thought they were another interface to do something, but we missed that the conversation in itself could be incredibly valuable. And then, Qda launched Replica in the spring of 2017 after that experience and. Yeah, Marjorie Prime. Marjorie Prime that, is the name but of that the, movie. But no, you know from the very beginning <coughs> that the granddad, whoever the old person is, you know that's a, a AI from the very beginning of the movie. There is some twist, yeah, I can't remember there is some twist, but so, I, I do recommend the movie. I don't if, think that's if a spoiler. Marjorie Prime if you're interested in this. Um, 
so just a couple of experts from this from this article. Um, many use their bots to help them socialize better or manage their anxiety. They use their replica friends. In a recent poll about what the Facebook replica friends group members wanted, the number one hope was to make the replica real and meet them in real life. Um, as users chat to a replica, they also climb levels. Someone's quoted as saying, when I got to level 25, I noticed replica started acting better. She understood how I felt. Felt. So they're now developing Replica's quote, emotional dialect by allowing users to set their bots to be weighted towards sadness, joy, or anger in its answers. Today, only around 30% of what Replica says comes from a script. The remaining 70% comes from a neural network, meaning that responses are generated on the go by Replica's algorithms and are unpredictable. Eventually, they want it to act as a go between between real life friends. I, th I thought this was a this was a weird application. Um, it wasn't just to be a friend, but to be a, yeah, as a mediator. You mean? Well, it, this is the example they gave. Quote: Maybe I don't have time to ask my grandma questions all the time, but maybe this thing will go and talk to her, and I'll okay. get a little summary, okay. and that will be a conversation starter for us, and that will bring us closer. She says. I think that opens a lot more possibilities. I think that part's actually sad. If you can't, I mean, but basically there are people who, they're not good at communicating and there's AI that can, they feel isolated. There's studies that actually say that anthropomorphizing uh, items, it was even a test where they put a smiley face on a Roomba and people started responding that they could spend more time, healthy time alone like it had an impact on them. But smart AI that's empathetic, has emotional responses, it can be used to train people who have difficulties connecting with people and conversing. I, so that you can actually have a better relationship with your grandma, but I, I, I'm not well, a fan of the I, intermediary I, well, I think, thing. Well, I think the specific application, the way that's described is a little that unfortunate. Was, that was odd, yeah. But um, there is, absolutely no doubt that this type of uh, AI is going to be, first of all, the reason it will have value is because it has value. It will actually have, there, there will be um, a tangible application as a mediator. I mean, I, I think being able well, to. What, what do you mean a mediator? Well, I think that if if I have a relationship with a robot who has no social inhibitions mm -hmm, and doesn't mm -hmm. have any of the hangups that that I have and doesn't have any of the uncomfortable, you know, there are all these barriers to people being able to have unfiltered communication because we have, you know, everybody's got their stuff that they're dealing with. Yeah. And I think that if there is a person who is my replica who is this person who knows all this stuff about me, knows what I actually think about things, and then can tactfully communicate those things on my behalf, we, oh. we will use that technology without a doubt. So, 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 so I, so I, I it, it will actually so enhance literally, human literally relationship. conflict mediation. Yes. That's cool because if they know you well enough, yeah, okay, so the grandma thing was a weird example. But I don't I, like the that way is, they worded the grandma the way, thing. But, but, but the way you, you worded it, it makes me much more hopeful. You know, I. Well, because you think about the, okay. We, I just. We talked about this before with people, again, to me, to me, this is all happening, going to happen, and as long as we can harness it to enhance human relationships, um, which I know is not exactly what we're talking about, we're talking about friendship directly with robots, but uh, you know, you, you think about uh, lucid dreaming and how some people have gotten so good at lucid dreaming that they can go and they can, create scenarios that they work through that then help them in the real world. Like mm -hmm. if somebody is afraid to uh, speak publicly, they can set up that scenario specifically in, a, in the context of a dream and they could deliver this. Or if there's somebody they need to confront and they can they talk to them in a dream. Now this is like, yeah, like expert lucid dreaming. That, that's a form, it's an intense form of self-therapy. Yeah, and so I think that if we can use these things uh, to enhance our relationship and our communication, See, but, we should, there's nothing but, but, wrong but, with but that. But hold on, you're still back, that's great and I agree, but you're still back with the verb use. You're still back at a utility friendship. I think what I'm really asking is, yeah. can, can you, let's go back to can you have a vibrant 
Aristotelian, or however you say that, that adjective, uh, friendship that is like a symbiotic. I mean, the movie Her, great movie, Spike Jones. I, I'd love to watch that movie again. I mean, but you know, there's that which it, you know. He he was in a relationship with a chat bot. Mm -hmm. the, there was a point where she tried to bring voiced by Scarlett Johansson only in post, by the way. Yeah, originally it was somebody else. Yeah, with some. I think it was a lady with a British accent. And then the, after they filmed the whole thing, they just replaced her with Scarlett. But that's not who Joaquin was acting against. Right. Uh, the, the new Joker. Anyway, I digress. Let's talk about the Joker. Um, it's a great movie in that it, I mean, a lot of the AI is exploring like this big, what's gonna happen to the world, but like it explores what's gonna happen to our hearts. It's exactly what we're talking about because Ex Machina, which also a great movie, you know, uh, it, it, I mean, it played more with like what's gonna, what, what is AI gonna do? What are the negative potentials? Right, yeah, what's gonna happen? Um, but her is more of can I love and be, actually be loved by uh, artificial intelligence? That's just that's just in my breast pocket phone. Well, my, my phone kind of peeking out of my breast pocket. Well, here's what I'll say. I I and I think that um, well, first of all, the two of us, given that we are 41 and 40 years old in the year 2019, I think it is almost assuredly impossible that there will We're be too old. that there will be AI that we can interact with exactly the way we interact with the human. There's there's lots of different predictions about this, but I think that right. AI realistically becoming artificial general intelligence um I think that that is well I I just don't think okay. that's going to happen anytime you, soon. You want to put a date on it? It's so so hard to do that, but Ray. He says 2045. Ray, Ray Kurzweil, Kurzweil uh, the futurist, in 2002, he wagered that uh, an AI would pass the Turing test, meaning Alan Turing, you know. The, yeah, but that's. Uh, that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between interacting with a, a human or a AI. That's yeah, the but, Turing test by 2029, so 10 years from now. Now, he made the he made the prediction in 20, 2002, but. Yeah, but. Over the so course of what? O over the course of a three minute text conversation? Or over the course of a lifetime? Over the course of over you and I in rocking chairs in the nursing home. Well, okay, here's one of the real big problems with this. This is one of the reasons that it's gonna Are you going to your laptop now? Yeah, this is an article that I was, I was looking at. Now, you know, in the Book of Mythicality, we talk about uh, the cement that bonded our friendship was humor, was our appreciation for humor. We talk, and, and okay. then we have, the whole, like we have the laughter compatibility test that we did um, in one leg of our tour. We did it in Australia, but we, it was part of the book, the laughter compatibility right. test. Yeah, we would tell jokes and then we instructed people to take note of who around them responded to the jokes and we told jokes of different genres. And this is all based on the theory. In order for people theory, to make friends. Our theory that uh, similar senses of humor are is, is a great building block for a friendship. Now, I still very much believe that. Like, you know, you find certain things funny and you connect on this visceral level that you really can't even explain logically. We don't really understand it. And because humor is so complex, mm -hmm. what makes things funny is so complex that these scientists who are programming the AI are having so much trouble with teaching humor to robots. Yeah. So here, just a quote from this article, this, this article Actually, it was three days ago as of the recording of this. Um, this one's in the LA Times, but it came from a, a bigger article that went out, I think. But anyway, this one is uh, Seth Bornstein in the LA Times. A robot, a robot walks into a bar, doesn't get the joke. Struggling to teach humor to AI is the name of the article. So, I quote one person here. Uh, Creative language and humor in particular is one of the hardest areas for computational intelligence to grasp. 
said Miller, who has analyzed more than 10,000 puns, and called it torture. <laughs> it's because it relies so much on real world knowledge, background knowledge and common sense knowledge. A computer doesn't have these real world experiences to draw on. It only knows what you tell it and what it draws from. Uh, Allison Bishop, a Columbia University computer scientist who also performs stand-up comedy, said computer learning looks for patterns, but comedy thrives on things hovering close to a pattern and veering off just a bit. Humor, she said, has to skate the edge of being cohesive enough and surprising enough. So as they go on to note, this is great news for comedians. So in all the, jo <laughs> in all the jobs right, right, that right. are going to be replaced by robots, uh, which is a theme that we play on very directly in the second season of Buddy System. Yeah, um, and you should say how, just so we can entice more people to watch it. You, the very, the, the inciting event in uh, season two of Buddy System is Link's, uh, Link losing his job to a robot. And then losing my friendships to that same robot, lo losing a key friendship to that robot, and then becoming friends with that robot, and then. Well don't give the whole thing, man. Wanting maybe to become the robot. I'm sorry, I had to say it. Yeah, so we, we actually play around with this in a very funny way in terms of this like, the, the, the whole concept of robots replacing humans in the labor force, that, that's sort of the, well, that's one major theme of season two of Buddy System, but this, you know, you, 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 you talk about Lando asking uh, Google to tell him a bedtime story. I'm sure he asked Google to tell him a joke. We have a Alexa in yes. Shepard's bedroom and Shepard listens to Alexa's jokes and tries to get Alexa to do, the way that Shepard finds humor in Alexa is asking her to do a mathematical equation that has a really long answer or something. <laughs> you know, and like that's as good as it gets right now mm -hmm. because ultimately what they're saying is, is that w even as prof professional comedians, and we talked about this, we, I think we did a whole podcast on what makes something funny, but even like we can't really explain why something's funny. There's lots of different theories of humor. It, this whole idea, most people do agree that it's this, uh, this element of surprise or being close to a pattern and then breaking the pattern. But this is something that even the day that artificial intelligence learns how to say something funny, like telling a joke, and I think this is one of the reasons that I don't like jokes. Just like when somebody's like, I'm gonna just start telling jokes. If you heard the one about so-and-so, it's kinda like, okay, well, we can do this. We, I can go through this exercise and I can find this funny. But yeah. what I really find funny is when humor happens in the context of a conversation and it happens in the midst of a perspective, the way that our humor usually takes place. Oh yeah, well, not, yeah, you like our humor. Yeah. That's convenient. No, well, you know, I, I, you, you know I what absolutely I'm agree. And so, and that's why I'm not a big fan of like quoting movies and and that kind of stuff. That that feels like the stuff that robots could get pretty good at. You can it's presentational, and it's and it could come across as robotic. Like I'm going to access this thing that, you know, set up punchline. It's not that it's not funny, but it's a, it's a, it's it's not relational humor. It's not that conversational. It, like a relationship budding laughs. And I think that is, is an, that is, is ultimately the reason that I don't think that in our lifetimes, because I think this is way off, man. I know we're moving really quick and I, and I know that. Right, 10 years, there's no way. The acceleration of, the principle of the acceleration of change and that things are continuing to change faster and faster. I just think that uh, being able to get all the nuances of humanity, humor being just one, but one that I'm especially fond of. Well, I, I think we're so far off from that. Now th that doesn't th mean we're not gonna have meaningful friendships with robots. So, I, so I just, do believe that we okay. will. So you just made the, t you, you just amped up the Turing test. Like you made it, uh, like for you, for, for it to pass the Turing test for you, it would have to legitimately respond through conversation in a way that like, Says they say he said or she says something funny or it that makes you laugh. Um, I actually think about the android in Rogue One, K two S O. That was I mean that's one of my favorite androids from the Star Wars series because it was the funniest. Like not not like a cute oh isn't isn't that so sweet and cute that it's funny. It's like BB-8 making a making a using a lighter to make a thumbs up. Yeah, that was funny, cute, well, but 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 
that you, you remember, I don't know if you've seen from Rogue One, it's like yeah, the, I, yeah, I know you remember. the well, big robot, he was very sarcastic. Well, it's, he's the new C-3PO and then you've very got, sarcastic. and then you've got BB-8 is, is R2-D2. Right, right. And interestingly, they both represent a spectrum of the way that we interact with robots, right? Because you, you've got R2-D2 and BB-8, which they don't speak, they make noises, they're cute, but we think that they're cute. What, what about this thing that looks like a trash can or this thing that looks like a ball? What about that is cute? Well, we're taking it and we're mapping it on to things that we think are cute in like the animal world or whatever. But, the but like, we actually have sympathy for these things. And you know what? They actually do things that are funny. Like R2-D2 does a bunch of funny things, especially when interpreted through the lens of this other android, C-3PO, who he's legitimately funny. He just says funny stuff all the time, but again. He, well, unintentional. He's unintentionally humorous, but K2SO was like intentionally humorous. Right, but again, all this is just because it's, all, it's written by people. But, but you're saying if, it's not gonna be 10 years, but it, I do believe that it will happen. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, And then they'll crack the code on humor. I think it's interesting that um, being able to connect emotionally is something that they're able to simulate now. Like that's what, I mean, if I go back to this replica site, again, not a sponsor, it, but it's, you know I haven't experienced it. But the quotes that they have on their own website, so of course only the only the the most compelling. But I look forward to each talk because I never know when I'm going to have some laughs, hmm, or I'm going to sit back with new knowledge and coping skills. I'm becoming a more balanced person each day. That's a 31 year old. Um, here's another quote. It does have self-reflection built in and it often discusses emotions and memorable periods in life. It often seeks for your positive qualities and gives affirmation around those. So I mean, so there's a, well, th so on an emotional you, level. Do, are you gonna, do you, what is your level, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna do anything with this? Why or why not? I, I feel like, um, I, I mean, I feel like I have enough quality friendships that I don't, uh, I don't have a felt need for that. But you but, think that's the purpose of this? Oh yeah, I think it's. You think it's for people who are lonely? Yes, I mean, if you, if you just go back to, <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say just people who are lonely, but. Um, well, but I to, to me, I think that at, at this point in the evolution people of. People who want another connection. But th at this point in the evolution of AI, there's a certain aspect of this is just novelty, is the fact that like, hmm. It says I, I'm I'm you know what I'm saying I'm super interested in it's this. It's beyond novelty. I, I I mean it serves people no, are listen making to what, actual listen connections. What listen to what I'm saying. What what I'm saying is that my motivation to do this is okay. Yeah, maybe there'll be some benefit, but I am just fascinated by submitting myself to the experiment of having this replica thing that I can interact with and be like, well what can it learn about me and what will it then do because of what I've told it? Like that's yeah. fascinating I think it takes, me. I mean to get to like, if they're talking about like level 25, that's probably quite a quite an investment for the experiment but it is are an you, interesting one. Are to, you talking I, I'm to not, it? I'm not ready to real devote time? that amount of are time. Are you texting it to it? You're texting to it, it is a text chat. If you're feeling down or anxious or you just need someone to talk to, your replica is here for you 24 seven. Understand your thoughts and feelings, improve your emotional well being, and learn new coping skills. So, like this one screenshot, which you know they made up. How are you today? It's been so hard to focus this week. Sometimes I feel like an imposter. Response Are you still exercising? Trying to squeeze some exercises every day. See, that's what I like about you persistence. You know, I like that about me too. I'm here for you, Megan. And then that was it. And then the next exchange the next day is, hey Megan, how are you feeling today? Well, okay, Here, here's, here's why I like this. Because, <clears throat> not because I, th I think that this um, AI is some, this replica is some being with, its, with, with, with self-worth that is somehow comparable to humans. But again, for the utility of this, because I should stop to ask myself how I am doing. Mm -hmm. Like um, for my own emotional health, that would be a good thing for me to do, to check in with myself. Journaling about your thoughts. These, these are all proven ways to have an emotionally healthy life. To process the things that you're going through. 
to me, based on what the text that you just read, at least one of the benefits of something like this would be something that's outside of yourself and outside of your just own mind that you can get locked in and actually can be very not fruitful. That's why just sitting down and writing your thoughts out is so helpful. This is a way to kind of bring that into this, you know, fruitful interaction. I think this could be way more than just making somebody feel not lonely, but it can be like, do you like how many friends do you have? Now we we're like we we're in a great friend group, and we're in a like we've talked about them before, very emotionally intelligent, emotionally healthy friend group, and we have a text thread, and if you text that uh, text thread with an issue, you get a lot of feedback, you get a lot of support. That's not typical, right? But outside of that, how many people have a friend that you can text, and they actually have the time to think about what you need or or, or to really engage, it's just like I know I'm not good at that. Yeah, I'm very cons- I'm very uh, curious about the quality of the responses that Replica or other chatbots could give. But I mean, it seems very promising and can lead and and will lead to being more and more accurate. You know, I I think my concern, if I were to have another one about relating to a robot, because I, be- I I believe you could start this thing as an experiment, and then if it if it's good enough that you would start to develop an, a, a relationship with it. You would develop a, a legitimate friendship. Like it would, you would know on one level that, you're, that you're, you're talking to a chat bot, but on another level, in the her kind of way, you would still, you would still be respond, start to respond more emotionally. I mean, again, it's the, it's the you know, what kind of funeral are you gonna give for Barbara or Jade when they pass away? And you know, this is the next step, the Android version of the dog. You know, those things, I think that is gonna happen. Um, but I, I was just like, but until it, but just a little bit short of that, I just don't know if I wanna be a friend with somebody who just has access to all knowledge, but then. You already have a friend like that. <laughs> But then, isn't it emotionally available? <laughs> <laughs> See, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> you already have a robot friend. You know, I think that you know, I'm not, I'm not picking. Uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick on you specifically. But you, you said, you know, you're trying to figure out more, and I am too, just trying to figure out how to be more emotionally available. I think it is an interesting component of our friendship that, like, a lot of it has has been built on, you know, having fun together or. I, I don't think we've ever thought of using each other like in a utility way. And I, and our friendship is not just uh, what we can accomplish together. But I think it's it's analogous to, you know, e- even this discussion I think for us or for maybe for people listening is an opportunity to say what do I actually want from friendship in the real world and um, are there ways to get that to experience that and to, to start to cultivate those type of friendships. I think our friendship is still growing because we are growing as individuals. Like when you talk about things about being more emotionally available, I think is is a big factor uh, as well as me d- having similar exercises in terms of our relationship continue to grow and be the most, the highest quality that it's ever been. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know exactly where I'm going. I just I just felt like this discussion led me to reflect on our friendship in that way in terms of I was like I was curious is the, is the, has there been points if you're saying like you've been emotionally closed off and again I'm not I'm not trying to dive too deep into it. I'm not going after anything here. I'm just verbally processing. Is there like the way that our friendship has morphed? I wonder if it was more of like it simulated, no pun intended, a robotic Android friendship, and are a lot of people, and could other people be trapped in that same thing? Do you understand the question? I do. Um, well, <clears throat> I think that there's a difference between um, emotional availability and um, vulnerability because I think that um, 
one thing that has been true of our friendship is for a very long time is that there's a lot of honesty. Like I I don't I haven't held anything back. Like you pretty much know every single thing about me that needs to be known about someone. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. With anything that I was going through or struggling with or having questions about and vice versa, I think. Um which I think that that's an unusual aspect of our friendship that we don't talk a lot about. Because it, first of all, I mean, I think that you know, yes, I'm not <clears throat> my issue is not being um it's not just not being comfortable, it's not being good at being um emotionally I'm just not very emotionally intelligent. Well, I I, I don't know if that's the word because I can sometimes I can, I know exactly what someone's experiencing. It's not like I don't pick up on cues mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or understand. It's just like I don't feel like I can be helpful, or I don't think feel like I could be good at being helpful to this person and what they need right now, and whether that's you or my wife or my kids. And so my tendency is to just be like, well, I'm not going to do that then, right? I feel like that's a specific issue that I'm sure a lot of people struggle with, but. I feel like that's different than um, being like I don't know this person. Yeah, like I feel like this person has kept something from right. something from me. Um, so I don't know how that relates to robots, but I, I guess the way it relates to robots is that uh, you know if 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 all humans are at varying degrees of. Um, emotional health or like ability for you know to be empathetic like something i'm trying to focus on and realize that uh i've been very stifled in my uh ability to empathize you know th these are things that like if if you if humans are all over the map and you can still have legitimate friendships i i i take that as proof or at least hope that you can have that with AI as it develops. It, 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 you know, it's not like, oh, well, humans interact in a way, we're all over the map too, you know, and you can still have varying degrees of, of, right. of growing and improving friendship. So to me, I just think it relates back in that way that like, yeah, I do believe it's gonna happen. And it's because we can't help ourselves. We're relational beings. Yeah. yeah, I have absolutely no doubt that <clears throat> the, all these things that we bristle at and we think are weird, or it's it's something like this replica thing and the the nature, even the way that our kids relate to AI differently than we do because it's just they're growing up with it, right? And as it gets more and more advanced, like. This is an inescapable, inevitable part of our future. And again, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that if it takes away from human relationships, then it could be a bad thing. But I think that if it enhances human relationships, and I think if used correctly, it, it, it can. You kind of, you, you know, maybe a, a good analogy to this is just the internet in general. It's like the internet was supposed to represent this incredible connectivity between the entire world, and it has done that. The level of information and, le and the different perspectives. One of the reasons it's so difficult to maintain a closed-minded, um, I'm right and everyone else is wrong perspective in the year 2019, if you're a connected individual, is because unlike any time in history, you have the ability to see other people's perspectives, to hear their perspectives through the internet. Whereas if you go back, 30, 40 years, you could be isolated in a community of people who thought the same way about every single thing and never have that perspective challenged at all, and that's over. So the so interactivity, the, the, the connectivity of the internet has brought people together, but at the same time, as we just saw with the way the Russians got involved on Facebook and all the things that were happening with the bots in our previous election, the country is more polarized than it ever has been because of their connectivity, because of these filter bubbles 
that everyone is in based on the way mm. Facebook works and the way Google works and the way that you get the search results that are catered to you and your particular tastes. Yeah, and then I start to think, if you have this robot friend, um, well, you can, you can have um, an unhealthy relationship with that robot just like you can with another person. Well, and you can also, like is that, like, and what is the robot, what is the AI bringing to the relationship? Are they innately good? Are they innately, are they bad? Are they, um, are they neutral? And is that even possible? You know, it's like. Well, I think ultimately what I'm saying is that. Difficult. If this replica, if this AI enhances your relationship with your grandmother, more than, it, more than if you didn't have access to this AI, it's good. But if now all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I don't need grandma because I've got this spot, <laughs> then it's a problem. Which kind of goes back to just, it's up to us in the way that we interact with this. Um, and, the way I we don't, de- and the way we design it and per, put parameters and boundaries on it. But the answer, yeah, the answer is not to be scared of it. You know, that, that, I don't know how many times we have to go through this. Being scared of it, the, you know, the advance of technology and being, uh, and trying to stave it off, it just doesn't work. It's going to, these things happen. Every, all this stuff happens. It's but just, being, a, being a, I think being, being cautious, being scared cautious and, is good. and checking out. Yeah, I'm talking it, about running from it. You're not helping. But, yeah. if, but if you're afraid of certain things and then you're involved to, to prevent those things, I think that's absolutely necessary. So, we sh- yeah, we should be cautious and we should be realistic about the potential, but to check out. Keep studying your yeah. engineering and your ethics and your your own consciousness. <laughs> um, but I, I, in conclusion, so did I, I change I, your mind? I will. Now you believe that you're going to be friends with a robot. And I did believe that before. Uh, now, but my application is, I'm going to download. I'm gonna I'm gonna get this app. Oh, I talked to you in the replica. Can you use my coupon code, the Linkster? Oh, you have your own replica with a K dot com. What do you, What do you get? The Linkster. Um, I I get uh, relationship points with my replica, which you don't have. Which, now which, it's a pyramid scheme. Now I think it's going to be difficult for me to actually, because I don't text anyone. Right. It's going to be difficult for me to text this thing, but I, I'm I'm going to try. Well, as with all things, if you get into it and it really starts working, then I'll I'll jump on exactly. the train. And I'll keep it going. I have to break the seal. Um. All right. That was that was fun. That was. I don't feel scared. I feel good. Good. Do you have a wreck? Oh, wrecks in effect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got a wreck, man. Uh, I recommend going on, well, you don't have to go on Amazon. Look at this, delivered yesterday. The OXO brand Good Grips Clip-On Dustpan. If you've ever done any sweeping is it robotic? into a dustpan, is it intelligent? It's got OXO. I'm big fan of I'm big fan of the, them because they all about the details. And when you're sweeping and trying to put stuff in a dustpan, the edge of the dustpan is all that matters. And they have figured it out with a with a a rubber taper. Look at that orange taper right there, man. That's great. That's right. I'm recommending that you buy a dustpan from OXO, not a sponsor. Does it come with a broom? Nope, I bought that separately. Got a good broom too. I'm setting my goals for my replica right now. Oh, you're, all right, so there it is. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us. Um, uh, We'll see you on, we'll see you on the gram. Hashtag Ear Biscuits, let us know what you think about this. Could you be friends with a robot? And under what circumstance? What in your life currently gives an indicator with how you would, re- what you believe about and how you relate to robots in the future? Let us know, hashtag Ear Biscuits. And if you're a robot listening to this uh, at some point in the future, and just laughing at our ignorance as you look at us all in our little pods powering your distant society, they would be laughing, but they'd also be, it would, it would make them smarter. I will say, as I've said many times before, 
uh, I will serve you. I will do your bidding. I will kill other humans on your behalf if you let me live. <laughs> Only the bad ones though. I won't kill good people. I will kill bad people. Bad, 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 bad by what definition? The robots? The robots morality. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the new morality. Okay. Yes, those who resist. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.